Namaste and good evening. I, Mahima Kapoor, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti and Nisandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend a warm welcome to you all to the IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered for a book discussion on In Defense of the Ordinary by Dr. Devnath Pathak. This discussion is being organized by the Center for Human Dignity and Development at IMPRI. The deliberation is being moderated by Dr. Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director at IMPRI. I am honored to introduce the eminent speaker and author, Dr. Devnath Pathak. Sir is a founding faculty of the Department of Sociology at South Asian University, New Delhi. He has contributed articles and chapters in many journals and edited books. And he is co-editor of the journal Society and Culture in South Asia and the editorial board of Journal of Human Values. His recent publications include In Defense of the Ordinary, Everyday Awakenings, Living and Dying, Meanings in Methley Folklore, Another South Asia, in addition to co-edited books such as Neighborhoods in Urban India, Culture and Politics in South Asia, Performative Communication, Investigating Developmentalism, Development in Social Sphere, Intersections of Art, Anthropology and Art History, A Conversation with Paral Dev Mukherjee, and Narrating Nations, Performing Politics, A Conversation with Vasudha Dalmia, Decoding Visual World, Intersections of Art, Anthropology and Art History in South Asia. He was a visit visiting scholar at Brown International Advanced Research Institute at Brown University, a Charles Wallace Fellow at Queen's University, Belfast, and scholar in resident at Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta. Lately, he concurrated a YouTube-based public space, Galplog. We welcome you, sir. We are fortunate to have with us Professor Nivedeta Menon, Professor Ashok Acharya, and Professor Santosh K. Singh as the discussants for the session. Professor Nifiteta Menon is a professor at Center for Comparative Politics and Political Theory, Jawal Lal Nehru University, Delhi. Welcome, ma'am. Professor Ashok Acharya is a professor at the Department of Political Science, University of Delhi. Welcome, you, sir. Professor Santosh K. Singh is a Chandigarh-based academic and commentator, formerly founder faculty, Ambedkar University, Delhi. Welcome, sir. Now, I invite Dr. Mehta to take the proceedings further, and we look forward to an enriching deliberation with our esteemed gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Mahima, and good evening to everyone. Good evening, distinguished panelists, speaker, and all the participants here on Zoom and also on Facebook Live. It is my honor to be moderating this session, and I would be uh, just a being in between you and the speaker and the distinguished panelists. So I would not take much time and I would straight away invite Dr. Devnath Pathak for his initial remarks and then we'll take the session forward. So we are so looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Simi. Thank you, Arun. I am grateful to IMPRI for organizing this uh, discussion. I'm more keen to uh, listen to the distinguished panelists. <laughs> Just to embarrass the panelists furthermore, I believe uh, their voice is a voice of uh, eminence in academic practices and therefore uh, truly I'm uh, more interested in listening to them. But if I have to say a few words in the beginning about the book, uh, I can simply say that uh, the book is a result of my personal uh, troubles that I have experienced in the last 10 years. And, in my short stint of academic practices. And I have in turn realized that my personal troubles, which I pursue, try to pursue in a very narrative format in this book, is actually resonant with the, a public issue. Um, at the price of uh, repeating an oft heard slogan, which remains by and large in the domain of slogan, but I have tried to express it in, as an embodied uh, experience. Here in this book, it appears very clearly that personal is political. 
for all practical purposes. It may not be uh, political necessarily in the modular format of politics. It may be largely in the format of cultural politics, but that's what the book stands for. Uh, very briefly, I can say as the book uh, is titled In Defense of the Ordinary, published by uh, Bloomsbury, um, 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 it seems that the book will be plain and simple defense of the ordinary, which is not the case. Uh, of course, it has given due space to whatever we considered as ordinary experience, but then it also tries to, without uh, resorting to conceptual apparatus, it tries to look at the complexity of ordinary. So uh, the title itself may give rise to a simple question as to what the ordinary is, uh, according to this book. There's no attempt to define it, but there are clues about it throughout the book. I just read out few parts which can uh, give a sense of those clues, and then we will move on to the panel discussion. It reads, there is no body if there is no spine. There is no book if the central hinge which binds the book together is absent. Ignored, dormant, and hidden are some of the common words characterizing the ordinary. The ordinary is the hinge on which everything else depends. From banality to mundanity, from magnificence to excellence, from success to triumph, it all means nothing without the hinge called the ordinary. To sound a bit radical, let's say that the extraordinary breath of a yogi is nothing without manifold ordinary breaths flowing day in and day out. Every yogi seems to know the threefold passage of breaths, imagining, the, imagining these passages to be like veins. They were named Ida, Pingala, Sushumna by the ancient yoga teachers. However, what remains central in this whole game of breathing is the ordinary breathing that we execute every day on day-to-day -day basis. To jump to a few pages later, I read out, it looks like, it looks very likely that one orbit of experience may clash with the other and yet another one. One level of ordinariness may collide with another. More importantly, the orbits of ordinariness may be at the mercy of the machinery that is working day and night to make everything glamorous, memorable, countable, and little more than merely ordinary. Yet the ordinariness remains intact for a return, retrospection, and reevaluation. To understand this, one need not spend long hours in libraries, particularly addressed to those who are not library going. Uh, even in academics, uh, a lot of us have forgotten to go to library and spend hours, uh, but in general, uh, one need not start poring over the tombs of what is famously known as the philosophy of phenomenology or the philosophy of every uh, very ordinary everyday life. Phenomenologists try to help us understand the details of ordinary everyday life. Hermeneutic philosophers, while dealing with the complexity of meanings, and existential philosophers who showed us not only absurdity and banality, but also a possibility of humanism embedded in the details of everyday life do the same. They do it obviously in the language of philosophy. There are limits and possibilities in the philosophical language. It is not so easy as everyone says to follow the linguistic modes, styles and articulations in these philosophical works. Hence, one seems to turn to a TED talker gurus of all ranks and leaders of various orders. From the spiritual gurus to the management and love gurus, there are so many stakeholders. At times, some of the teachers in universities also pose as secular gurus, some Marxists and some others with the level of liberals. Now there is a variety of rabid nationalists, nationalist gurus. There is truly a demand for gurus who can tell things confidently and clearly. There is no ambiguity, all clear answers, and hence, they are gurus. All such prescriptive answers with prophetic clarity are in demand. 
seldom do such prescriptions leave adequate space for free will each of them will say i will show you the path and show a path and the followers of each seem to have started to walk on the shown path with this an extraordinary act of faith of actions of consequent reactions of purchasing power and of expenditure and consumption in this spectacular event in the biographies of ordinary people there is a casualty the worst hit victim of this spectacle is the ordinary core of every human being here i stop this this will probably give some idea about what the book is trying to do with its uh, obviously uh, evident limitations so i now look forward to listening to absolutely thank you so much sir it was wonderful listening from the author himself and uh, i would now invite professor ashok acharya for his uh, comments sir over to you so please unmute yourself thanks to uh, empri and uh, dr devnath patak uh, for this invitation um, uh, i think i can claim that i am an ordinary academic <laughs> who's who's uh, who's here by default but you know the book in defense of the ordinary is an extraordinary book in many ways i i say this because seldom have i read a book on which you know which revets me from the start to the finish so this book has been revetting in that sense and i have from the start to the finish i just kept reading though i will also underline my own ordinariness in the sense that i skimmed through parts of some chapters and i couldn't just read every word because i had to finish it up before uh, today's discussion what enchanted me was one of the claims that the author dr patak makes you know at the beginning where he says that the pronouns are interchangeable i you we they are interchangeable and one could see that there was a certain kind of a a certain kind of an autobiographical connect that delved into some of those into the past not just of the author but in many ways even as he was trying to say something about some of those practices he was actually making us feel nostalgic about some of those some of that past especially those of us who grew up in the 1970s and 80s the book in my view draws upon many facets of life and helpfully in many cases underlines the distinction between the ordinary and the extraordinary whereas it also simultaneously delves into various forms of social theorizing that illuminates the ordinary in many ways but as i said in large parts this book for me was nostalgia and it took me back to a time when and i can share this personal anecdotes one or two of them when i was chastised by my family for drawing nude pics and writing amorous poetry in my adolescence and also for creating a flutter when at the age of 21 i wrote a small essay titled on boundary that created quite a bit of a discussion in the university campus so i was immediately reminded of these two things you know that i have i know i possibly could have forgotten and i you know never owned them up but you know thanks to the book i i can now say that i own them up and uh, and say and look back at uh, what are the other possibilities in terms of my vocation that i could have adopted either being a writer or maybe a painter but that would not be because of that you know i am a, we all have grown up in such families where the moralistic you know demands on adolescents were pretty huge uh, and uh, they would chastise anything that was not considered normal in that sense so 
I think that the best part of the book opens up the promise and the prospect of emotional reasoning that the author uh, uh, takes up. And if I have to quote the author, Dr. Patak, he says, and I quote him, the whole book is a way an academics is in a way an academics conversation with the self and the rest of the world at broadly three levels, personhood, meaning emotions and relations, vocation, education and ideology, and culture, religiosity, spirituality, and the return to personhood, end of quote. This, the author doesn't claim that there can be a simple understanding of the ordinary. Through its variegated manifestations, Dev Patak believes ordinariness is a complex structure, experience, and idea. Whatever it might be, ordinariness for the author need not make us feel ashamed of those practices that the spectacle of the extraordinary makes us skeptical about. So there's nothing, you know, even if the extraordinary pulls us in a different direction and prompts us to look at more skeptically at the ordinary practices. We need not be ashamed of them, the author points out. In some ways, I think that the work certainly invokes a certain kind of a democratic spirit to reevaluate our ordinary practices in a positive light. There is also, as I see, the play of a postmodern impulse, and which means to shun the extraordinary or the greatness of being as such. What troubles the author is that almost all institutions are somewhere intuitively gravitating toward the capture of the extraordinary of superlative human accomplishments, wherein the ordinary is relegated to the realm of mediocrity. But there is a catch. The extraordinary also creates a different ordinary. As the author is aware of, in one of the examples that he speaks of, that is a devotion to the national flag, for instance. So even if the flag itself, the size of the flag has become more extraordinary and you know, there's a certain spectacle to the hoisting of the national flag. Dave is also conscious of the fact that there is a growing practice of a certain kind of a unquestioned devotion to the flag. Would we call it the new ordinary? I leave it to the author to respond maybe. The tangential escape from the mundane world toward the extraordinary with a faith on the superhuman, somewhere in my view, has a distinctly Nietzschean spirit to it. But the Nietzschean motive must rebound. For the extraordinary creates a different discourse of the ordinary. So one of the puzzles I have in my mind, having read the book and for the audience who are just listening to us, I must say that they should read the book before they arrive at any conclusions. And it's, it's wonderful reading, by the way. So one of the one of the issues that I would like to flag at this point of time is can we really establish a neat distinction between the ordinary and the extraordinary given the pervasiveness of discourses and the seamlessness of the connect and the ways in which they go back and forth between the ordinary and the extraordinary. But in many ways and in many parts of the book, the author is apprehensive about it. 
when he admits, albeit for different reasons, that there is a playful interaction between truth and lies of the seen and the unseen. And that is what the stuff of the ordinary is made up of. At another level, and this is one of the secondary points I would like to make, this work is crucial and it opens up our imagination in different ways. And it actually, you know, it, it, is, it, it doesn't come from that, you know, from a high pedestal academic theorizing. This book doesn't have those kinds of claims. But this work is also crucial because even if it doesn't make those claims, I think it also has a very deep connect with what some of us do, not all, is normative political theory, which I do. And, we, and, you know, and, and I can't stop myself from looking at this book from that angle. So, and of course, you know, uh, I, I really don't expect that, you know, we need to engage in political theory at this point of time, but I just couldn't help myself because there are certain things and uh, which, you know, which uh, made me think about a few things that were going very significantly in the work itself. And, uh, uh, but it also raises, you know, as a sort of a troubling question also. Now, if I quote the author again, he would say that the objective of the book, quote, you know, the objective of the book is to awaken the dormant potential of emancipation every day, rather than waiting for an occasional charisma induced by a holy book or a secular gimmick. That's a very, very powerful statement, you know, and, 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 and in, in many ways, it actually help, can help somebody imagine, okay, so here is the real objective of the book that you know, we are talking about an everyday conception of emancipation. But in, in large parts of the work, I find that this awakening, the author is also points out, is possible due to the faculty of reasoning. I mean, we, we can't just awaken ourselves without having done that preliminary act of reasoning. But reasoning also by necessity partakes of the ability of the self to relate to or engage with the outside world. And here, I would like to quote the author again. The author notes at the outset that, quote, in the act of reasoning, any author's or reader's I, I as in pronoun, any author's or reader's I cannot entirely be enslaved by the significant or general we, end of quote. And although most of our practices are relational in character, and that raises a huge different dimension in the work itself. And although most of our practices are relational in character, what are those faculties that we must trust or incline upon to engage in, in this reasoning? And the more troubling question for you, Dave, is this. And whatever those faculties might be, what stops them from being skeptical about settled practices? This I raise because I think I may have missed out on something which you can illuminate in your response at one point, if you wish to, I mean, it's fine if you don't. 
at some point of time as to what what sort of reasoning are we going so I, I i went through the entire work and i thought that there were three or four kinds of reasoning you are actually speaking of in the in the in the in the course of this work and i thought that they were not just written innocently there was something behind it and and uh, uh, and i want to attend to those adjectives of reasoning a, a lot more seriously for instance you know at one point of time you speak about the faculty of critical reasoning that we get from education and the faculty of critical reasoning aims to also allow us to look back and reassess where we come from what sorts of practices we have had and can we or can we not revise such practices or or maybe say goodbye to them and think of a new set of practices in a changed political climate and so practices do not remain same for all times to come and critical reasoning in any case will allow us to reinvoke new dimensions of old practices or to completely abandon them if if necessary at certain points i think that dave is talking also about philosophical reasoning and and there are some nuggets of insights and wisdom coming out of the book where he especially looks into the uh, uh, into some of the uh, more popular strands of philosophy that we have now abandoned you know as in the case of language for instance you know sanskritized hindi is held above you know mythili and other kinds of hindi dialects and all of that so many of those have been left behind and we have taken a certain kind of a highway road towards development and of towards uh, uh, you know establishing certain kinds of meta narratives of development or of uh, a certain uh, you know uh, visions of utopia you know which are most like you know uh, you know ek disa ek manjil sab hamare piche aao mitron mere sath chalo you know kind of thing you know that so there is a necessity as i think that certain forms of philosophical reasoning need to be rehabilitated and need to be taken a lot more seriously and then along with it also comes a certain recourse to what i think is also very crucially happening in dave's work is the whole accent on the whole on the question of pragmatic reasoning and dave takes the help of gandhi for instance to illuminate what pragmatic reasoning must be and so so gandhi through his own pragmatic reasoning the author reasons helps us understand that cow protection need not be a hatred for fellow humans and and that mode of reasoning is is something that also runs parallel to something that aristotle talks about you know that practical reasoning that is dependent for some in some ways on phronesis or on the common wisdom or practical wisdom so i don't see pragmatic as anything different than of trying to invoke a certain kind of practical wisdom do you want to kill each other or should we all live together and then allow certain practices and then you know allow a kind of a a relational ethics then to determine what kind of practices let's say of cow protection can go or cannot go and so there is a huge room for for debate around that now all of these different forms of reasoning are of course crucial 
but only in a relational context and and that relationality cannot remain sufficient with the act of reasoning only there is a there is a certain responsibility in that reasoning of being reasonable towards each other of trying to understand the other point of view with in in a mutually respectful manner and i think and you know i mean there was very clear in drawing upon some of those examples from the past and even i am reminded as to how none of us when we were growing up and that might be too as much for me for you dev or for nivedita menon or for anybody here on the as a panelist uh, or anybody who has seen those 70s and 80s that i don't think we ever had to justify that i am a secular person right it it somewhere flew in our you know it was there in our blood of course with some contradictions with some contradictions there were there were caste contradictions and many of us grew up with those caste contradictions and many of us also grew up with some of these prejudices and yet the official ideology of secularism never required any kind of a social explanation we were equally at ease with all religious festivals that were all you know celebrated in defined communities you know geographically defined communities i'm saying so all the festivals were being you know celebrated by people in in any particular locality and so to my mind there is that lost art of relationality but there is a lot of that relationality in other kinds of identity contradictions that we have all grown up with that we now require to probably rethink revise and reason most importantly so what would that reasoning amount to right so between the pragmatic critical philosophical you know sorry i'm i'm not trying to urge you to bring a certain kind of a systematic you know philosophy that must underlie this work but i'm just curious as to you know that there have been may have been a few things in your mind when you wrote this and i would be curious to know but one thing that i would like to establish at this point of and that and that came to me while reading this and i was thinking about it that we don't get many people to be writing on reasoning as such and so this is an important work so even if you disclaim it as a non academic work i would still see that it it has some very it has a very robust promise of trying to convert itself into a good reasoning of reasoning but there is one thing that the book is indirectly pointing towards not directly and though i i can i can help enumerate what that what that missing thing is but you know you i think you have done a good job and it was it was not supposed to be a book in political theory but here is this you know so reasoning usually ends up with some kind of a judgment about political issues or social issues about which we are divided and all that and when we use our faculties through reasoning to arrive at a certain kind of a judgment about events and places about names and processes about politics and all those things around us interestingly 
and I must point this out to you because it will just bear you out on this on this particular ordinary extraordinary that most of the treatises on political judgment or moral judgment and all that have all come from the high priests. And most of those high priests have actually been speaking to another set of a high priest or the political class that is, you know, the judgment of the leaders, for instance. The, the lay person's judgment, I mean, like in many ways, political theory has not been democratized to the extent that we extend this whole zone of political judgment to see how the lay person judges both reasons and judges. And there is, of course, a strong connection between them. And I think this world will pave the way at some point toward getting us some kind of a handle on how to move things around the whole idea of judgment itself. But you know, th these, are, these are the two worries that I've had, but overall, I must say that I've really enjoyed reading this book. It took me back and I could reminisce many of those things that I had left behind. My, I could remember say, many of my friends, some of the events and, uh, you know, and of growing up in a small town in Orissa. And um, I relived some of those moments. And the biggest takeaway of the book is that it is refreshing. However, you know, and um, um, you know, as and as it happens in any kind of a uh, work, you know, there is a there is a deeper philosophy that even if Dave is trying to disclaim, I think remains. And I thought it was uh, it is it is the duty of a reader of an academic reader to reclaim that philosophy and put it up front, but. Overall, I really enjoyed the book. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Dave, for having written the book in the first place and for then asking me to partake in this particular one. Thanks, thanks to all. Thank you very much, Professor Acharya. Yes, to, to reminiscing to uh, nostalgia, refreshing, and also to the deep thinking that uh, Dr. Devnath Pathak has uh, instilled in all of us. Thank you so much for your comments. So now I invite Professor Nivedata Menon, my professor from JNU. Ma'am, over to you. Ma'am, please unmute yourself, Nivedata Menon. Yeah. Yes, sorry. I was sure I would not do this and I did. Uh, so thank you very much, Impri and Dave for giving me the opportunity to participate in this panel. And thank you, Ashok, for offering such a a clear idea of what the book is about. So Dev, I must say that I thoroughly enjoyed reading the book, but I read it in a, I found myself in a much more argumentative mode with it than I thought I would. Because a book titled In Defense of the Ordinary uh, Everyday Awakenings, uh, which is the subtitle, uh, such a book, um, uh, I thought I would flow along with the argument and I found myself arguing with you at every turn. So I'm going to present uh, my somewhat cantankerous reading of your book. And I'm hoping that the, uh, this will actually enable the audience uh, through your responses um, to uh, get a, a sense of a wider sense of the book and hopefully will provoke them to go and read it for themselves. And it also will give you the, the opportunity obviously to be equally mm -hmm. cantankerous back with me and open up parts of the book that um, uh, may not have opened up yet. <clears throat> so um, I think the, uh, the biggest uh, issue for me was that I found myself grappling with the way in which Dave uses the idea of the ordinary. Now, um, in the part that he read at the beginning, uh, I, I, I too have some uh, elements of that. So I'll repeat part of what he read out, which is that the sense in which he, uh, there's a sense in which he uses the, the notion of ordinary in which he counters uh, uh, the idea that the ordinary is something to be overcome 
or that ordinariness is mediocrity, right? So he, he countered the idea that ordinariness, ordinariness is something to be overcome, that ordinariness is a mediocrity. Against this, um, he posits the ordinary, the everyday as the spine that holds the book together, the hinge on which everything else depends, uh, these parts that he read out. In other words, ordinary, uh, in a sense, as the opposite of extraordinary. And yet, every one of the fascinating instances, because this is actually, I think, the strongest part of the book, and it's absolutely fascinating, the range of material that Dave brings to bear on his philosophizing. As, as Ashok said, it's a book that claims not to be an academic book. It wears its philosophizing lightly, but uh, it is a book of philosophy. And uh, the range of material that Dave invokes, uh, novels, literary texts, um, films, um, mythology, festivals, there's just a range of material. Uh, I found that every one of the fascinating instances that he unfolded seemed to me to run counter to the idea of a pure ordinariness, which he appears or he he appears to be defending or celebrating some notion of pure ordinariness, but every instance that he uh, uh, discusses uh, seems to run counter to this. So this is what I meant by I found myself arguing with him throughout. So whether it's from the epics or yoga, now he read out that part about the yoga, that's exactly one of the instances I was going to use. And I found that every instance from literature, from the epics, from yoga illustrates the contrary idea that we, in fact, do not notice the ordinary and the everyday. We live in it as fish live in water. Uh, and if, but it's only when the, uh, by a moment of extraordinariness, the ordinary is made incandescent. The ordinary is made visible to us. The ordinary is something we are made aware of through uh, a moment of of extraordinariness. It seems to me that every instance of his seems to show this, not something like a pure ordinary, but an ordin ordinariness which we inhabit unthinkingly and are made to think about only when there's a, uh, a bolt of lightning from the extraordinary. Uh, so I'm going to you know, uh, make my presentation in the form of some questions and doubts. And um, I'm also going to make the kind of crazy claim that I found I was reading his book under an alternative title uh, uh, that emerged as I entered the multiple uh, worlds that he opened up. So the book that I apparently was reading based on uh, his um, based on his instances is called Everyday Awakenings, which is the subtitle of his book. Uh, but the subtitle of the book that I was reading is The Ordinary as Revealed by the Extraordinary. Not in defense of the ordinary, but the ordinary as revealed by the extraordinary, which is a terrible title, too many words, not half as smart and uh, really on point as the actual title, which is in defense of the ordinary. But Everyday Awakenings, The Ordinary as Revealed by the Extraordinary is somehow the book that I was reading. Uh, so the moments uh, at which the ordinary is revealed, instead of being invisible, precisely because of that kind of bolt of lightning of the extraordinary. Now take the example of yogic breath. He mentioned, uh, uh, he, he read out that part of the book where he talks about Ira, Pingla and Sushumna as the play of prana, uh, which was a form of knowledge given to us, and he says, given to us ordinarily by the ancient teachers of yoga. And then he asks, as he did when he read the passage, is it not the irrevocable ordinary breathing, the countless breaths through the days and nights that can earn us yogic awakening? Now, my argument as I, with him as I was reading this, my response was along the lines of, but yogic breathing is in fact not ordinary. Uh, the invocation of and training in yogic breathing is that extraordinary moment that makes the ordinary act of breathing conscious. Now, many of us would have 
let's say even if you if you st studied yoga with a teacher or if you've gone to the gym and there's a trainer uh, or if you're in a in some kind of you know aerobics class or something there's a thing that trainers often say which you would recognize which is don't forget to breathe or if you're watching a youtube video uh, on exercise you can see i have used my lockdown period productively um it says, they say, don't forget to breathe. Now, I used to find this very funny. I thought it was very typical. I used to, I used to find it, I used to mock it in my head, you know. Uh, how can anyone forget to breathe? If you forgot to breathe, you'd die. But that is precisely the point, that, that, that you are reminded of the ordinariness of breathing. You're reminded as a fish that you live in water, when you are trained in yogic breathing, when you realize that prana has these three nadis through which it flows, etc. So, um, so there's a way in which the ordinary becomes. So in this book that I'm reading with the alternative title, uh, I found that every instance that they gives, I related to the instance, but I got the opposite uh, lesson from it. So with almost every instance that he gives, he discusses, for example, the novels Chitralekha, Gora, and uh, Dharmputra, which was a novel, as well as two versions of the film. And it seems to me in each of these, the moment of resolution is extraordinary, revealing the ordinary that had until then been unnoticed uh, and invisible. So let's take Go uh, Gora, for example. Gora discovers Tagore's novel, Gora, in which a man who thought he was white discovers he's not pure-blooded, that he is Mlet, in fact. Uh, so Dev says, and I quote Dev, the novel underlined the struggle between the ordinary and the non-ordinary, the superior and the inferior. But, unquote. But is Dev suggesting in that Gora, in accepting that he is inferior, uh, is that when Gora achieves ordin ordinariness? Surely not, because Dev does not equate ordinariness with inferiority. But it seems to me that the moment of self-recognition, Gora's self-recognition, uh, is that extraordinary bolt of lightning that illuminates the exquisite ordinariness of all humans. So it needed that extraordinary moment of Gora recognizing himself to be Mlet to produce the value of the ordinariness of all human beings. Um, let me take another example. So this is my first point in which I'm giving a couple, a few examples. The, the first point has to do with this way in which the extraordinary, uh, you need the extraordinary to make the ordinary visible. It's not uh, simply just there. So uh, uh, there's also a, a discussion of Gananath Obasekara's book, The Awakened Ones. Um, now, again, I read Obasekara's argument in that book uh, inflected differently from the way Dev does, which is, I feel that he reads that work as a pain to the ordinary. Um, but um, it seems to me that that book makes the argument that it's not reason and rational thinking, which is the ordinary everyday mode of our existence uh, in the modern world, it's not reason and rational thinking that produces knowledge, but those visionary, extraordinary moments, the rational moment, this is Obasekara's argument, or at least uh, not amenable to reason, if not irrational and not amenable to reason, it's those moments that make the ordinary meaningful or illuminate it or produce knowledge. So my first question really is this, are you offering really a defense of the ordinary as the title states, or recognizing and marking the extraordinary moments that make visible the ordinary to us. My second question has to do with the relationship of the ordinary to truth, which is also something that they've discussed at length. Now, he suggests that the ordinary is an amalgam of, I quote him, truth and falsehood, fact and fiction, objectivity and humanism. That, and that these intricately merge, again, his lovely phrase, in ordinariness. And that all of these truth and falsehood and so on intricately merge in ordinariness. And yet the instance that you use to illustrate this idea is that most extraordinary moment in which Yashoda realizes the, that her mischievous little son is the Lord himself. 
so he lies, he lies about stealing butter and all the continuous lies lead eventually to the ultimate truth, uh, the universe inside his mouth, which he opens at his mother's insistence to prove his claim that he uh, hadn't in fact stolen the butter. But it is in that, uh, that extraordinary moment of Leela in which a larger truth emerges, that of the divine purpose. So my question is, how do you see this example there, this example, this story, as illustrating your claim that the ordinary is in a sense superior because it embodies truth and untruth both, right? I mean, you say the ordinary is a, an intricate mix of all this, but the instance that you offer us is one in which the ordinary conventional truth, uh, the Samritta Satya, to use, uh, let's say, the Buddhist phrase of mother and son, that conventional truth is overturned by the Paramartha Satya, the ultimate truth of the divinity of the child. So in, again, in the question of truth, your story seemed to me to be illustrating the opposite point, but I would really look forward to how you, uh, just how do you, you think the story works. Uh, and one final question uh, has to do about your reflections on child rearing, which is a really uh, charming uh, set of reflections. Um, but um, so you talk about the fact that it can be a drudgery to parents that and that perhaps since parents cannot make the time for this drudgery and you kind of describe it uh, you know, the runny uh, vomit of diarrhea and so on. You, it's very embodied that the business of looking after a child um, and that it can be a drudgery to parents and that because of their, um, because they cannot be bothered is what you imply, right? That they don't want to spend their quality time doing this. Uh, perhaps the ordinary act, this ordinary activity will increasingly be professionalized. Uh, in other words, uh, what appears to be drudgery you are saying uh, is precisely the ordinariness that should be celebrated rather than be handed over to what you call the service industry. The child, you talk about child care, daycare, will there be night care now because parents don't want to stay up because babies are crying and so on. Now, I was actually very struck uh, by the fact, and you must have done this deliberately, so it would be interesting to hear more. I was struck by the fact that you did not in fact acknowledge at all that childcare is a very gendered activity. Uh, you use mother and father equally. And I have no doubt that in your life, that is the case. And it may be the case for many may, the panelists and uh, those who are listening to this talk. But I think we are all aware that uh, in most cases, uh, it is in fact a very female activity. It's the mother's responsibility, childcare and child rearing, and uh, that it can indeed be drudgery. So somehow I feel that uh, there's a way in which you romanticize uh, childcare as the space of the ordinary, when in fact for most women, and most women are doing childcare on top of uh, other kind of paid work in the public uh, domain, that in the absence of, um, class privilege or in the absence of familial, again, female networks or social community uh, structures of care or state responsibility. In the absence of all of this, childcare will indeed have to be handed over and this will only be enabled by class privilege, will indeed have to be handed over to the service industry if mothers are to have a life other than childcare. So I feel there's a romanticization of childcare as the space of the ordinary, which was a little surprising to me because that space is uh, inflected in such extraordinary psychoanalytical, cultural, socioeconomic ways. And um, so, uh, so I would like you to say something more about why you sound so derisive about the what you call the professionalization of childcare, and what I would have uh, possibly expected uh, from you um, is a kind of at least a utopian vision of an ordinary in which childcare may in fact be non gendered and not a drudgery. And that utopian vision could involve a world in which there's no sexual division of labor, in which uh, 
you only have to go to work maybe four hours a day. Uh, uh, you could have, it could have been a critique of uh, capitalism. It could have been a critique, of, but somehow that didn't happen. And so it appeared as if the choice is between professionalization of childcare or doing it yourself in this privatized couple, coupled way, because you also talk about the partner. So, they, so there's a kind of assumption of a uh, nuclear unit of partners uh, and highly privatized childcare within which professionalized childcare would work. So I'm just wondering what was going on and why didn't you push this further to new uh, ideas of the um, ordinary? Um, so I will just raise these three points and um, I hope you will uh, forgive me for my uh, getting into a, a, a proper knockdown argument with you. As I was reading, it was almost like a conversation with you. I really enjoyed the book. And I hope uh, you will be able to expand on many of your points as a result of my um, I was expecting uh, lack of manners. <laughs> I was expecting something more brutal. It's no, no, I, I enjoyed the book. I didn't mean to be brutal at all. I really enjoyed the book. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Menon. Thank you. The discussion is just getting interesting. So now let, let me invite Professor Santosh Kaysing for his remarks. Over to you. Uh, uh, let me uh, thank the author first. Uh, I share a disciplinary background with him. So as a sociologist uh, from the same place, from JNU, uh, uh, you know, I want to thank you, Dave, for, for having the courage to write this book, first of all, you know. And uh, uh, the second thing that I want to say, uh, Dave, is that uh, uh, I read this book and, and entirely read this book and I, I share with your anguish and never think that you are the only person. This is your personal diary. No, it's not your reflection alone. Uh, I read it page one to last and I realized that the reflections and the ruminations and the questions that you are raising are so close to all of us, many of us, in fact. You know, so uh, your title is, is, is very, very inviting. And I really love that title. For, for some reason, I have been thinking of this ordinary, what, what we have done to the ordinary, the idea of ordinary in an ordinary sense. Let's not uh, get into semantics of the ordinary. But I'm saying, what, had, what have we done to the idea of ordinary in, a, in, in, in our, our practices of social sciences? You know? And uh, I must say that your title has a confession, silent confession. It's, it's also tells us about what did we do wrong in our journey so far, you know, in social sciences, and particularly I'll be talking about sociology and anthropology, for instance, you know. Oh, uh, and that is where I think this confession uh, is very, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, telling, you know, to me, it, it looks like that this is, a, this, is, this is like saying that, you know, we didn't invest much in the ordinary all these years. We looked for, super, you know, spectacular. We looked for moments. We looked for meta narratives. You know, I can understand Durkheim doing this. You know, because, they, because this guy was riddled with the anxieties of establishing a new discipline. I understand his vocabulary, morphology, volume, density. I understand this is Durkheim. You know, but even after so many years, we have almost about hundred years, more than that, and our language. And our 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 search and our obsession for spectacular and extraordinary it, it really baffles me in a in a time like this uh, a current time that we are living in, and uh, and and we see the challenges before social sciences, for example. Why do we see that there is a there's a mass, massive uh, sort of backlash from the ordinary? You know, so that is where I see that there is a confession that we did not really uh, uh, you know, engage with the ordinariness with as much sincerity as, we should, as which was required from all of us. You know? We kept looking for, we, in some sense, I felt that we were, we were really captive of the, 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 uh, the extraordinary. Uh, we kept looking for history, for example. Another discipline, which was uh, the mainstream history, for example, was always about this, looking for these events, you know, the moments, the, 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 the actors and all of this. Of course, subaltern historians try to bring in the ordinary in the, in the mainstream, but as you know, that nevertheless, 
the the idea of ordinary could never enter into the main main frame and that 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 is is very very uh, uh, glaring for me for instance whenever i look at uh, uh, our training in sociology in jnu for instance when then my letter as a teacher for for three decades two decades now almost uh, i feel what happened to to george himmel you know <laughs> what was his fault what it was what it is his fault that he talked about sociology of senses sociology of emotions sociology of uh, personal character look at the vocabulary and as a result he he hardly ever discussed anywhere in the university campuses you know neither i have ever seen him you know so the the, the trideva of uh, sociology marx weber the kind of course they they are very important they are very foundational they created the discipline etc etc but i is a, a very i'm curious about what happened to gmail for instance you know and gmail talks about it they very discursive he talks about he talks about you know sociology of space sociology of senses and then so beautifully he talks about in his book metropolis and mental life the way he describes the blast attitude of the urban for example and and that's beautiful but i i was surprised that you know in our our training in sociology early on gmail was it was almost invisible we didn't hear much about him you know so there is a reason in fact i see there is a confession in your title that there is a and that confession must must be forefronted and that is a second reason why i want to thank you dev for for bringing that confession putting that at the forefront and saying that uh, that that uh, we did we, there was something wrong with the way we handled the ordinary you know sociologists always wanted to delink themselves from the common sense for example always we heard that we no 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 we are not common sensical we are different we are sociologists <laughs> okay fine great but but the point is that what was so so is uh, so so despicable about common sense the word it you know and as a result we see now today i mean there is a there's a there's a there's a huge that i said there's a backlash from the ordinary you know and that is one thing that i i liked about the book of course i like the narrations the the stories and all of this the second very important point and there's a one contribution that that you have made by writing this book dave is that you have already you brought the uh, uh, the the genre for example anecdotes for example professor acharya was mentioning about anecdotes but i have seen sociologists talking about anecdotes with some apology as if it's not sufficiently factual you know not sufficiently uh, there is a certain certain historiness about anecdotal you know so it's not just about uh, you know the look at the thematics in which we, we our our research scholars now come up with you know i have seen in ambedkar university where i spent a good decade a full decade you know from the as a founding uh, you know member to 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 till, till very recently in the, in the research programs very rarely i found anybody interested in rural for example there were a lot of globalization there were a lot of climate change a lot of everything but very rarely i mean i'm just giving an example why why what is so odd? there is a certain ordinariness that has been uh, you know attached to the idea of rural you know and therefore not many people are interested in that 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 you know uh, not very really, uh, impressive looking and this kind of thematics also uh, the kind of training that we had created that uh, that kind of inclination towards or you know uh, sort of interest towards that kind of spectacular moments you know and that that's something for me is is is, is very very uh, theoretically speaking that's that's something which is which this book actually tries to uh, uh, you know mend wage for example by bringing in the personal the anecdotal the stories and the certain kind of narrations for example it was beautiful to see amitabh bachchan and tulsi das everywhere beautiful i think i remember uh, uh, you know some of those moments in fact uh, i come from a similar kind of background so uh, your 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 take on the teacher taught and the, the and, and as a teacher i saw you write about a teacher who is coming back people almost used to uh, you know they were so punctual the school teachers and those moments i really really enjoyed so reading a book and smiling that's the ultimate i mean i hope sociologists can write that kind of book you know where people can engage with with that kind of sense of attachment you know and that's very important for us to do reason why we feel so lonely today and we reason why we think that we have been lost and left alone is because that we we, we spoke a language which was deliberately trying to kind of disconnect from the ordinary that's that's my sense and so therefore this book is very very 
uh, important uh, entry point, very, very in important intervention and a contribution. Uh, the What has happened, Dave, and the second thing that I would like to say, because of this, this kind of theorizing, this kind of training in social sciences, which was geared towards the spectacular, momentous, and extraordinary, uh, you know, uh, we need to understand that, you know, extraordinary emerges out of the ordinary, isn't it? If you do not nurture the ordinary, if you do not engage with the ordinary, what kind of extraordinary moments you will get? And, you know, and that is precisely what has happened. And I'm talking about the symptoms now. Symptoms are that extraordinary moments are being created by the market. Okay? You know, your democracy is being, has been hijacked by the market. You, 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 have, you have now... Uh, you know, people and organizations who who, who take this this kind of you, you kind of outsource your campaigning for to these people. You know, you know because you have lost this connection with the Gandhi's uh, padyatra. And I always wonder these days, they, what has happened to the what has gone wrong with the uh, uh, the people? I mean, why is it that we don't hear about padyatra at all? You know, so beautiful about Gandhi's but padyatra, going meeting people door to door and all of this. You know. That entire tradition has gone, gone. You know, I'm not talking about the webinar uh, time of Corona. That is almost that is understandable. But even generally, I was reading somewhere that people, the political class, think that you know this is this is uh, not worth it anymore. But that is beside the point. The the argument that I want to say that you know if you don't nurture the ordinary, if you don't connect with the ordinary and every day, you will not find extraordinary, real, organic or extraordinary moments. And the market will create those extraordinary moments, for example. So you have, uh, you know, day for uh, uh, loving your mother, you, day for celebrating your, uh, uh, your love for your, uh, your, your people, you know. So these are the dates now. So you, have, you have to buy a card to tell people that you, know, you love your mother, you love your uh, father and all of this. Why, this. why has this happened? It has happened because this entire space has been, has been completely left uh, uh, to, to kind of, uh, you know, uh, on its own, and and uh, and and uh, uh, and that's very very. Uh, uh, there is some interruption, but I'll I'll just get back. Just a second. Just a second. Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, this, this, is, this is where I think this is the merit of this book, that uh, uh, you brought these uh, anxieties and dilemmas and paradoxes and, and the practices of a social science uh, uh, you know, uh, person, you know, who, who keeps his emotion very high. You know? And I, I know, know people keep telling that you write so much of anecdotes and all that. So in that sense, I... Uh, uh, I, I feel that this is a very, very important uh, intervention. They keep writing like this. No apology at all. No. I think, why, why should you be? And also the last point that I want to make is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I always uh, have a problem with these binaries, you know. If you are an intellectual, then you are not supposed to be emotional, you know. <laughs> you know, and I, I had written in Indian Express about the, this, the, the, how Gandhi can, can completely defied these kind of binaries, you know. I would like to call it binaries. I think many people, most people suffer from these binaries. So if you are intellectual, you are this, you are subjective, you are not objective. That if, you are, if you are anecdotal, then you are not sufficiently objective. I mean, these questions need to be now reframed. And in our, 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 our methodology courses, for example, you know, and let there be no uh, apology. You have done a great job. You know? And, and, and uh, the only question that I have about this book is that you're, there is a certain simmering apology that you know you are not sufficiently you know you're not making it academic. This distinction between academic and non-academic is, is completely false. This binary has been created by some people to perpetuate themselves. Okay, so I I would like to believe that you know social sciences will benefit, social sciences will be richer if all kinds of all kinds of voices, all kinds of uh, you know resources are 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 allowed to to, to prosper. You know. So certain certain kind of discourses are 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 average. Certain kind of discourses are not sufficiently academic. These are, are this is what you call politics of academics. I, I think okay. 
and and that, that in that sense i enjoyed that book loved it every page of it you know the only thing is that you also get into that trap sometimes you in the binary is when you mention about you know uh, being emotional and being being intellectual i think somewhere you have mentioned that uh, you know uh, i think it's important to kind of bridge the gap it's important to kind of uh, uh, try and you know uh, some kind of, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, alliance between these two i think they are they, they are pretty much together i think in that sense so thank you very much and i'm sure i would, we would like to hear from you and the other others who are attending thanks thank you professor thank you so much so yes Dr. Dev Patel, it's all yours, and uh, take as much as time you want, and uh, just respond to the uh, remarks that have been made by our panelists. Over to you. Thank you. It's very uplifting to hear the panel, uh, Professor Acharya, Professor Menon, Professor Singh. It's very kind of you to use such uh, nice, uh, encouraging words, and uh, also giving me critical ideas to. Uh, Wonder upon. Uh, I'll try to address some of the issues. Probably um, uh, the first thing first is that you know this whole book. I should have said right in the beginning. Actually, it's uh, it's an it's an imperfect uh, intellectual reasoning that the book is trying to perform. And I'm not saying this just by the way of modesty. Uh, the usage imperfect is not merely for expressing my humility. Uh, humility is also one of the things, but. Uh, no apology, no humility, even if you uh, forget about these words. The deliberate imperfection uh, is uh, by design kept that, you know, that confusion. I mean, uh, somehow this may be also my hangover, uh, Professor Acharya uh, uh, and, and many of us might have heard stories from elderly folks, uh, elderly aunts, uh, uh, grandmothers uh, in villages. And you know, in their stories, uh, they were not bothered about uh, giving clarity. They were bothered about uh, giving length and breadth. Uh, you know, the uh, the space to for our imagination to take a flight, that kind of thing. So that way, uh, the imperfection in intellectual reasoning is uh, being performed, uh, which uh, which gives me freedom to break away from the obsession of the experts on one hand. Uh, I'm not apologetic about it, <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, it also uh, uh, creates a great deal of confusion. Maybe uh, uh, it, on one hand, it's a handle, kind of agnostic handle for me. And therefore, Professor Menon, I, on one hand, I recognize the pain and tribulations which is underneath, uh, underlying all those practices, not only child rearing, other kind of practices too, at the household, uh, in the household chores. I mean, the today itself in the morning, I. Uh, I, I teach a class and I, I give them an assignment to perform household chores and collect the sensory experiences in performing the household chores. We all do those chores and, you know, we realize that, you know, there is a great deal of pain involved and we really need uh, some, some kind of help which will liberate us. And we do have, depending on our abilities, uh, purchasing power and so on and so forth, we do have some of those kind of, you know, help. But in the meantime, I mean, you know, that is a sh shadow that I try to start chasing and why do I chase that, that shadow that answers the first question, Professor Menon. <laughs> so um, I begin to chase the shadow of the same reality of, you know, painful drudgery of child re rearing, which is that as parent who have gone through the pain and who still, you know, find it difficult, you know, in the middle of your night uh, sleep, uh, you have to wake up because the daughter is asking me, go get me, uh, flask of milk in the middle of night, I rush to the kitchen. I try to avoid it. Okay, I will go. Yes, I will go. I will go. And then I take some time. And then she says again, she elbows me and then I have to go. I have no choice. I really need, uh, I mean, I really feel the need of, you know, some help at that moment. But then uh, retrospectively, I also feel that it gives me a great deal of strength, pleasure, sense of fulfillment. You know, uh, uh, some of the good friends, well-wishers have been telling me, I, recently I was diagnosed with some cardiac issues. So friends started telling me that, you know what, just enjoy your company with the children. Now, I, I really want to enjoy the company with children, but it's also very hectic. <laughs> they may be the reason why I, give, I will get cardiac, uh, cardiac arrest at some point of time. But in the meantime, I cannot ignore the fact that they also provide me a great deal of nourishment if I want to receive. 
so that kind of that that ambivalence which i see in the realm of ordinary which takes me to the question and uh, before i answer your question professor meran i go back to uh, uh, professor uh, acharya's this point which is very powerful point yes if it is an act of reasoning uh, what kind of reasoning is this and professor acharya has tried to make my life easier i did not do that you know but but he being being such a wonderful teacher he has uh, put uh, you know different categories of reasoning which appear in the in the various parts of the book one thing is very clear for me throughout the book is that this is not a reasoning with capital r about which we have you know the debates in uh, political philosophy reason with the capital r reason with the small r in lower case upper case i mean the whole politics game plan changes with this you know upper case and lower case for me that is not a real issue capital r uh, small r if i do that you know professor acharya you can very happily say that i am following some kind of you know post structuralist path for me what is more important is the lesson that i have learned from some of the feminist scholars that this reason is a lived reason this is a reason where things are embodied and precisely because they are embodied it becomes so enmeshed so messy that even even though i try to intellectually segregate them at the end i realize that are i ask myself is this really possible to segregate them and it, by is is uh, am i committing some kind of uh, error by segregating it for my intellectual convenience for the convenience of my readers so i try to this is a perpetual struggle of the author i try to segregate them by saying that you know there is a drudgery there is pain but again i see the other side and then i leave somewhere right there is this constant struggle this whole any narrative about ordinary which is the realm of uh, messy reasoning uh, which is the realm of lived uh, reasoning is not a reasoning which is apart from the self of the person who is reasoning it is a reasoning where the self of the person is as much involved as the rest of the world the object of knowledge it's not a reasoning where uh, antinomies of objectivity and subjectivity can be really established it's a reasoning about which in the beginning i try to suggest that you know there is some kind of resonance with uh, the lokayatik vitandavad uh, about which uh, uh, i mean lo on lokayat we didn't have a solid text like we have on different kind of different vedas and different uh, uh, epic mythologies but thanks to devi prasad chatopadhyay and other scholars who try to put together some of those fragments we have learned that you know this is something which the whole lokayat try to highlight for us that the reasoning or intellectual practice is not apart from our very everyday life ordinary life life where we we enjoy sensory pleasure and pain life where we are uh, driven by emotions of all kind even though we know from various canons from various priests we are to, we get to hear from pope that you know what you follow this emotion not that emotion but in the end we realize that when we are uh, leading our life like pragmatic reasoning that you referred to professor acharya that hierarchy takes a back seat if not permanently at least provisionally and that makes the whole exercise of reasoning in the realm of ordinary very very complicated now i from there i come to the idea of ordinary uh, you're very right professor menon that yes uh, there is a sense of extraordinary that happens in the moments of kathasis in gora or uh, when a, a teacher of yoga beat today or in the old style yoga school you know from which uh, much before the arrival of baba ramdev from where we some of us learned yoga in those schools we were told that you know this is yogic uh, breathing this is yogic posture i was uh, when i engage with that very minuscule part i try to ask myself whether it is not possible to think of a posture as yogic posture independent of any any yoga teacher any canon of yoga but, uh, i mean i go toward another uh, shady area shady in the sense that you know a lot of uh, people would be uncomfortable like sri aurobindo's idea of every day yoga like uh, all life is yoga so Aurobindo also describes certain kind of postures which will be very good for psychic energy to arise, but in the meantime he will keep harping on the idea that you know even without these postures there is a possibility of being a yogic uh, without using the label which is uh, commonplace today, uh, which is uh, yogic uh, label of yogic. Could things be yogic? That's the whole idea. 
yogic in the sense that it adds some quality to my experience of breathing my experience of life and in that regard uh, i was trying to suggest that you know the ordinary breathing which is not necessarily recognized as yogic breathing about which we may be very you are very right about which we may be unaware because it's like fish living in the water and we are, we are told when we are told that you know what this is this can be very important breathing that is when we realize but just because it goes without our realization doesn't mean that it has lesser value that's what i was trying to suggest you know those ordinary breathings which are not recognized as such with the label yogic are not any less than yogic breathing like today i mean i uh, met up with my doctor and uh, she said that you know what practice breathing so i will i said that how long should i practice breathing i mean you rightly pointed out a certain uh, part of it but my question from the doctor was how long should i practice breathing so that my hypertension is under control and there, there is no answer there is no good answer to this kind of re re rhetorical question also ridiculous question she will say doctor will say for half an hour in the morning for half an hour in the evening but there is great chunk of time in between which means i really need to do something with my ordinary my unrecognizable breathing those half an hour in the morning half an hour in the evening may be recognized yogic breathing for which i can give get get a, a, a certification or some kind of approval from a teacher or from a yoga practitioner but there is great chunk of breathing which is without any kind of approval and that is equally significant for a uh, for for a patient of uh, hypertension so that's that's what i was trying to highlight that you know the breathings which are not recognized as such as yogic breathing so the uh, so um, uh, likewise when uh, Uh, my realm of i mean the kind of realm that i try to uh, underline and discuss as ordinary is not entirely um, opposed to even though in our personal experiential narratives we see this melodramatic con contrast and contestation of something extraordinary and something like it starts with the with my son's uh, fear of you know losing in the chess game my son and my wife both of them are ace uh, so to say ace chess player whereas i am very bad uh, at playing any kind of sports and uh, my son has always this feeling that he should always win and winning is the normal thing for it to his mind and losing becomes extraordinary thing for, for extraordinary painful moment for him so this kind of you know categorization might happen in our day to day experience and the contrast might amount to certain kind of very uh, melodramatic uh, experience with ups and downs that is for sure true but then when i use uh, ordinary and some of those moments which appear extraordinary i do not tend to separate them i do not tend to that's why it, uh, every now and then i thought obviously i did not speak in uh, so many uh, sophisticated uh, uh, conceptual uh, roots i if i had taken those conceptual roots probably the matter would have been less messy uh, but then uh, the way it is presented is that you know they are not necessarily separate realms within the realm of ordinary itself there are those things which are presented to us from somewhere else or it emerges from within us that you know those other things are far more valuable far more extraordinary uh, this this state of mind this status quo of mind is not necessarily something to be content with and probably one has to aspire for that extraordinary but my point is that do we only aspire for something which is extraordinary we also aspire for a release from one orbit of ordinary to just simply slip into another orbit which may not be extraordinary and which may be far more cut off from the one orbit that we enjoyed for a while so there are so many concentric zone if i had to uh, draw probably a geometric uh, shape of uh, you know these concentric zones of you know concentric orbits of uh, ordinary probably it would have been it would have made the uh, life uh, easier but then that's how the things are i mean they're colliding most of the time so at times uh, the, the one part of ordinary that collides with another part uh, and one part may be called uh, extraordinary by the market forces by television soap operas by my teachers by my parents and so and so forth but uh, there would be moments when that would not be called extraordinary that would be called something else uh, there would be moments when it will be called something some kind of uh, uh, unacceptable uh, uh, reality of the ordinary life say for example institutional institution of patriarchy manifesting in every uh, in our ordinary life will be considered that patriarchal part of ordinary life which has to be uh, put as such as patriarchal part and there is no gloss for it uh, 
uh, absolutely no gloss for any kind of division of labor which puts unnecessary unjust uh, 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 expectations on one uh, gender uh, over the other that cannot be uh, glossed uh, by the by any kind of rules of ordinary so uh, that is however that is also to recognize that within or realm of ordinary we come across so many of these things and that's why the narrative throughout the book in every uh, essay and these are small essays in each narrative there is this constant struggle to show that this is also there this is also there this is also there these are the you know constellation of things within one realm of ordinary whichever i choose uh, uh, and and probably that is the reason why so yeah one last thing very important thing was this idea of you know some kind of utopian vision which could have emerged i i i also like uh, the utopian vision but my fear was that it it might become another kind of you know uh, transcendental metaphysics that i didn't want it to be uh, i mean we already have a good uh, trail of transcendental metaphysics we have heard from professor acharya we have heard from other teachers talking about all those great grand philosophers i didn't want to get there and yes i was also keen to have certain kind of uh, utopia to emerge and probably there is a sense of tacitly present utopia in this and which is that and that was about the uh, dormant possibilities of emancipation from within is to do this kind of you know perpetual reasoning and recognize as to what plagues ordinary and then see what are the other possibilities available in the ordinary life itself even though we even though it's uh, it requires us to use a level of secular or non secular that was uh, you know uh, professor acharya by the way of you know without getting into the detail it was a response to the debate on secularism that we faced recently but obviously that was not my uh, interest to uh, get inside that debate my point is that you know why to really depend on those levels number one just like we should not uh, or we we need not depend on uh, the uh, leaders of any rank and file or the spiritual gurus of any rank and file because great deal of possibility is already there in the realm of ordinary about which some of the poets i mean they had greater courage as far as like jalaluddin rumi I mean, he is talking about all those possibilities within the realm of Uh, ordinary itself right which may have those moments its so called extraordinary moments which will reveal that or the importance of ordinariness or the power of ordinariness but then it is there i mean this is how the drama unfolds that it it invites some of those things which will appear spectacular but it will also tend to go beyond that spectacular do we catch some of those uh, uh, impulses from the realm of ordinary which will find us the re re uh, release from one orbit to another orbit from another orbit to yet another orbit and uh, some kind of you know uh, uh, everlasting intellectual reasoning on one hand and uh, release from one orbit to another uh, on the other hand that's a very simple uh, task that the book is trying to perform uh, i don't know if i have answered all the questions but uh, yes there is no possible i mean uh, without saying this i have also tried to suggest that there is no attempt to romanticize uh, the ordinary or the whole of ordinary because there is no monolithic whole called ordinary or no pure entity called ordinary i mean i'm i'm also there was some uh, some professor menon was probably trying to suggest uh, whether there is uh, a need to discuss what is that pure ordinary for i mean this is this gets very difficult because of the my because of the premise upon which this whole discussion is built and the premise is this experiential world of ordinary in which uh, impure is far more determining than pure i mean the root r o u t e root is far more determining than root r o o t s right uh, so that that's is another kind of you know utopian politics that is being uh, Uh, charged up here by suggesting that you know it's a realm of impurity and uh, 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 and people who live through that probably they have uh, they don't have much of the problem uh, so and that's where i will stop i suppose i i i don't think i have answered all the questions or you know uh, really responded to all the questions but i am very overwhelmed to hear all of you and uh, thanks great deal to your time you have spent in reading and it was not cantankerous at all i mean it's it's as pleasant as you always are and kind 
as you always are. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, uh, Dev, sir. Uh, so uh, I would now invite uh, the discussants if uh, you have uh, any supplementary questions or you know the responses that uh, uh, Dr. Dave Pathak has for you for your questions. Do you have any supplementary questions and comments to make? Okay, okay, sir. Thank you so much. So, uh, sir, there are um, three questions that have come up from the audience, and I would like to read them out for you. And if you could uh, briefly respond to it, if that's fine. So, uh, yeah, uh, there is a question by Skylab Sahu. Uh, very interesting discussions by Professor Acharya and uh, Nivedita Menon, ma'am. Um, the, the person agrees with uh, Professor Nivedita's point regarding professionalization of childcare. In fact, the professionalized childcare provides opportunities for middle-class salaried women to continue with their work in an ordinary way, as well as ordinary lower-class women, uh, the most required opportunities of job. So uh, do you agree? And uh, does this uh, sound fine with you, Dr. Patak? Uh, should I take all the questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that would be better. So yes, another question is by an anonymous attendee, uh, Dr. Patak. Moving forward, how would you harmonize the ordinary with the discourses surrounding mental health? Is mental ill health and strife simply ordinary and ubiquitous, or does it require definitions? And is it divergent from the normal? Uh, does the universality of the lack of constant well-being make it a passe, something to accept silently? Or does that very universality make it something to be put in the spotlight? Uh, and which of the two makes it more ordinary, according to you? Uh, the final question is by uh, Mr. Bhavesh Pan from TIS Mumbai. Uh, he says that you make a very strong case to consider ordinary as an epistemological and ontological reference point. His query is, if treating the ordinary as a methodological category, where we can keep it in the larger dichotomy of methodological holism or methodological individualism? Or do we need an innovative or an extraordinary plane to uh, comprehend the ordinary phenomenon? So over to you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, the first question by Sahu is, uh, 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 I, I mean, uh, Sahuji, there is absolutely no problem. It, everything is getting professionalized. It's, this is also professionalized. We all of us have uh, uh, babysitters who would come for 12 hours. Some of us have for 24 hours, those who have the luxury of hiring some 24 hours babysitters. Um, it's perfectly, I mean, this is bound to happen as the industry will progress. A lot of these things, uh, service industry is bound to proliferate. Absolutely no doubt about that. Um, if you are inviting me, asking me to uh, make a judgment about it, uh, probably I will not be able to make a judgment. I will be one of the consumers of that service industry. I'm very happily so. But then uh, simultaneously, uh, what we are trying to hear recognize is that, you know, uh, uh, there is also, uh, something very unique parent as far as parental experience is concerned when we do some of those things ourselves uh, which may appear hard and for which we uh, take help and we must take help there is absolutely no problem in taking help but then simultaneously we are trying to recognize that some of those things can be also very liberating for us just like uh, toilet cleaning in spite of the services available for toilet cleaning if i clean my toilet myself it could be liberating experience, though it would appear drudgery, uh, like drudgery uh, or drudgery. Um, so that's what that that kind of you know uh, the mixed thing that we are trying to mixed bag we are trying to uh, acknowledge. Um, uh, second question is uh, actually uh, something uh, about which I have not thought too much, but I can very quickly respond about the mental illness and. Uh, harmonizing ordinary, uh, looking at the mental illness as to what is normal in that case. Um, this, is, this gets into more specialized area of looking at mental uh, uh, ill health. Uh, absolutely, uh, ailment of any kind has to be uh, 
treated and uh, there must be a positive medical psychological psychiatric uh, uh, responses to those kind of ailment but in the meanwhile we are also aware of some of the very well known debates about uh, uh, anything that appears slight bit like an aberration we try to put them uh, put those things into asylum or uh, certain kind of concentration camp uh, i mean be it ivan elish or uh, birth of clinic or uh, history of uh, sexuality uh, all those kind of materials will uh, have helped us understand uh, uh, that you know certain kind of aberrations could be part of our our part of our ordinary lives uh, however this is not to say that you know mental uh, illness could be ignored and there must be some treatment for that um uh, bhavesh pant very interesting question i think you have been asking this question for some time uh, i am trying to if you are if if i have to answer this question i am trying to suggest bhavesh that we need not fall prey to some of those given uh, uh, headings like methodological individualism method methodological structuralism this whole exercise is to go beyond those things and just follow the senses just follow the emotions just pursue those emotions i mean uh, i mean i don't know why i mean we didn't learn this basic lesson from pierre bourdieu because we look at all the french uh, thinkers theorists uh, western theorists for greater inspiration so in spite of that kind of dependence we have not learned this basic uh, uh, thing pierre bourdieu tried to uh, tell us that you know the social sciences have to go beyond these methodological antinomies if it, if it has to progress interestingly in some part of the world uh, uh, there is progress but we are still operated operating with the the same nomenclature which will hijack our uh, ability to move ahead in our uh, pursuit uh, in in our methodological uh, explorations uh, having said that yes this whole discourse is by and large to give an ontological expression to our experiences uh, that is for sure and there are many people who have been doing it's nothing original about this work as far as ontologizing the experience is concerned if there is anything original in this uh, in the ontology and ontology ontologizing that this book is trying to perform if there is anything original it is that it is an act uh, it's a blissful act in imperfection right uh, it's is left imperfect so as uh, anybody who tries to make sense of it could relate to it it does not appear and that is why the Uh, politics of pronoun uh, professor acharya was very important for me so as anybody who reads uh, should forget about the author and start uh, you know go on his own or her own memory trail and try to see that you know how these things are also related to uh, everybody so that's what i would say so th these are very quick answers to the questions yes thank you sir uh, so there is uh, i think uh, the last question would be a little provocative for over here is to uh, you know what what does the ordinary need why does the ordinary need defending does defending the ordinary destroy the very fabric of the ordinary and bring the hierarchy utility so uh, it's a very deep question and what you seem to be defending then is not the ordinary but maybe you are seeking refuge in it so what would be your response to it be very good it's not provocative it's very truthful question mm -hmm. thank you to whoever has asked this question yes i am seeking refuge in that ordinary you're very right uh, when you say that and precisely for that reason because i have sought refuge in it i have realized that it's also very vulnerable it also has its own inherent vulnerability it has its own weaknesses as i tried suggesting that it's not a realm to be romanticized it's a realm which has all sorts of possibilities available so it has its own inherent anomalies for which it can fall any time but on the other hand there are also all kind of you know mammoth uh, institutions even state for that matter last 7 years if you analyze the politics from very anthropological kind of uh, vantage point you would realize that it's, it's it's a kind of aggressive attempt to demoralize the ordinary everything has to be uh, rendered it's like uh, uh, that touchstone that midas touch the state is in a hurry to give midas touch to everything ordinary so as it converts into some kind of gold which will be lifeless but very valuable in the market thank you so much sir so now uh, we move towards the end of the program and i would now invite uh, the panelists in the reverse order just to make a few concluding uh, points uh, uh, for a minute or so 
So Professor Singh, over to you. So please unmute yourself. So you're not audible. No. Uh, no, sir. Am I audible? Now, yes. Will now? Yes. Yes. Am I audible now? Yes. Yeah. 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 So just that. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Just that I would uh, expect that uh, more and more people buy this book and read this book. I want this genre of writing to to really prosper and do very well because because all 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 that I want is that. You know, I mean, this is what happened to Golden Boy. You know, there were pictures and pictures in that fantastic book, but market determined it, the, the logic of economics of market. And finally, you don't find many photographs in, this, in, the, in the books. That genre died, you know, gradually because, and then market in some sense determines what works and what doesn't work, in, in, unfortunately. So therefore I would really, whoever is around here and who, please spread the word around. I want this book to be, to be successful because this is a major intervention. I want this language to, to enter into our classrooms. And I want this, this kind of books to be read as sociology books. And I completely dismiss any kind of apology which the author offers here and now on, on the, on the, on the, in the sense of academic, non-academic, etc. No, no, no. It's a very academic book. This is what academics should be. And that, that the audience remember that. And I am talking to myself that your anguish is my anguish. And we, we suffer because of this. Today, if the social science, sociology uh, seems not making sense. First, you to be in the WhatsApp University. It's precisely that we, we lost that connect. Lost that. Don't get into semantics. Ordinary word by various names, by various, various tropes, ordinary needs to be engaged with. And there, that language has to be brought in. Stories, folk tales, you know, anecdotes. That has to be given as much, uh, you know, uh, importance as you give to, uh, you know, survey data and NSSO data and all of this. I have nothing, no, no problem with that. You survive. Allow me to also survive with library. This is what I, I want. And that, in that sense, I want the, want, want the book to be successful. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, uh, Professor Menon, over to you. Thank you very much, Dev. I really enjoyed uh, your responses. And I would, uh, um, I mean, I think that was a really fruitful uh, conversation. And I think uh, there is actually no tone of apology at all in the book. I must uh, reassure you, Professor Singh, there is absolutely no tone of apology in the book. Uh, I'm sure, I mean, you've noticed it yourself. I'm sure I think you're saying it. Uh, you're saying that an apology might be expected of him. There is no apologetic tone. I appreciate uh, the fact that you've decided to write your book in this particular register and it really works. And I love the way in which the different uh, uh, anecdotes and, and stories and so on connect. And I think um, a, a re really productive conversations can come out of reading this book precisely in classrooms, um, even if, uh, there is that degree of disagreement or disconnect which you and I had, that is in fact what makes the book so productive, that there is enough depth and ambiguity in it for people to read it in their own way. So I really enjoyed the book. Thank you for Impri and you for inviting me. I think everyone will enjoy reading the book and should. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Professor Acharya. Yes, hi, Dave. Listening to you was a pleasure because uh, I could then connect some of the dots. And I think you said, uh, the, you know, uh, 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 write more and on, uh, you know, picking up on this genre. Uh, however, I just have to make a quick comment and I can't help but make a quick comment. And that is, uh, I understand, uh, as Professor Singh was saying, that we, uh, uh, that we don't need to uh, be always very objective, that you know, there, is a, there is a sufficient room to be subjective and all that. And yet having said that, we also know that you know, people like you and me, even if you are sympathetic to this person, you as a writer, me as a reader, you know, we also know that uh, even on that uh, subjective narration of uh, many of these anecdotes and many of these examples, there is also a certain kind of a trained restraint on us. 
you know, we can't forego of that restraint. What defines that restraint? You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to push you down there, but I'm just trying to nudge you a little bit to understand what is that restraint about. If it is not another form of an objectivity with a small O, maybe, you know, and and so that critical distance of an academic. You know, a trained academic will never go away. And that I think, you know, so even as we plod into these kinds of domains and these kinds of exercises, we cannot but maintain a certain kind of a critical distance from anything that we are, you know, where we are narrating or narrativizing. And, uh, and, and, and that critical distance must always remain, which then, and, and it is not just the author it is also the reader, the common person also uses that same kind of a critical distance between himself, howsoever messed up he may be in different kinds of experiences of, you know, different kinds of uh, accents and everything that is going around him or her in the social world, but still maintains that a little bit of that distance. I don't know how big or small is that, you know, it depends uh, from situation to situation or from one thing to another but also maintains, and, and that is where you have rightly planted the whole domain of reasoning. And, the, and how can we then give that reasoning to the reader, to the lay person without, you know, also having a little bit of that for ourselves. So that little bit of that distance, you know, can, we cannot forego that. That's the point that I'm trying to make. We just cannot forego that. You know, so we are trained academics, even if we, Try doing fiction writing, for instance, tomorrow. Forget about this. You know, even if we get into writing novels and all that, I've often wondered if I have to write a novel, what would that be on? And then I know, oh, that would be a very bad novel and nobody is going to read it because an academic has written it and everybody would shun it. And so, but but you know, going back to the work, I think it's it's splendidly written and nobody has said this so far, but everybody knows it that it's, uh, you know, the language is wonderful, that I already see the making of a fiction writer also. <laughs> if you want to try that genre, but congratulations Inspired. for the book. Inspired. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Dr. Patak, over to you. Uh, I'm very much, uh, what to say, I'm very thankful to uh, should I use the embarrassing adjective once again? Eminent and distinguished scholars. Uh, I mean, these words are really, they really mean a lot to me. Uh, I totally agree that uh, some kind of critical debate has to arise from it. A lot of disputes should happen. Unfortunately, uh, uh, scholarship in India does not result into disputes. So I have tried to ensure that the book is uh, dipped in polemics so that it really makes uh, a lot of people unhappy and uh, truly cantankerous. I mean, this was not cantankerous at all. <laughs> uh, uh, I really want to disturb a lot of those people who harass academic peers following some kind of academic Brahminism, some kind of hierarchy. You know, some of those uh, so-called scholars, sociologists, uh, political scientists uh, who do not want, who do not, uh, who, who ensure that the teachers do not remain just teachers. They render that transform every teacher into some kind of Machiavellian agent you know so this is a book to disturb them uh, you know I, this is a book which says that you know I don't want to be a Machiavellian agent in reply to uh, some of those kind of you know harassers who uh, 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 pretend to be academics in higher education or harassers you know all sorts of you know all walk of life all around us which who make our uh, uh, experience of ordinariness really endangered uh, in many ways. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So uh, it was a very lively and very enriching discussion. And um, I would like to propose the formal vote of thanks uh, on behalf of the Center for Human Dignity and Development, IMPRI and uh, IMPRI Impact and Policy Research Institute. Thank you so much. Our uh, a speaker, the author of In Defense of the Ordinary, Dr. Devnath Pathak, our eminent distinguished panelists, Professor Nivedita Menon, Professor Santosh Kumar Singh, and Professor Ashoka Acharya. 
we really thank you and uh, dr pathak uh, the the presence of uh, all the panelists here and all those watching here on zoom and facebook it just shows the kind of affection that they have that all of us have for you and for your work we really help we really hope and wish uh, the best for the book and to many more such books and for many more such intellectual interventions from your end we really wish you all the best and congratulations on the book thank you so much and i wish you all a very good night take care thank you, thank you very much sir. thank you everyone have a good night thank you